Hello, everybody, and welcome. If um, there may be a lot of us on here, I'm going to keep monitoring um, the waiting room to let people in. But if you could do me a huge favor and just turn off your sound so we don't get all the sound in. And um, I'll let you know how this is going to work. So I'm Robin with Pretzel Kids. I'm here with Corey Kay. Um, with Pretzel Kids also. And um, Corey Kelleher will be monitoring the chat. So if you guys have any questions, put them on the chat. She'll be pulling the questions out of the chat and, um, and then, you know, asking those questions at the end, at the end of our session. And if you have questions that pop up during the session or during the Q&A, you can pop those into the chat too. Um, so with that, I am going to introduce our speaker today. So let me just let a couple people, more people in. Um, so our esteemed speaker today is another Corey. There's two Corys with us today. Corey Sterling is the founder of the heart leading law firm Conscious Council. He's also a lawyer, a small business owner, a group fitness instructor, and a yoga teacher. He wrote the book, Yoga Law Book, and has served hundreds of clients in the health and yoga space all across the world, the majority of whom own or operate a fitness. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you have your sound on, please, please, please favor, turn that off. Thank you. Okay. Corey won the award for highest rated session at Mind Body Gold, Bold, sorry, although we can call it Gold too, amongst the field of health and fitness leading minds and best presenters. He is the only lawyer to hold the Mind Body Business Consulting Program Certificate. So I am honored to have Corey with us in our group today. And for those of us just joining, some people are still coming in. Um, I'm Robin with Pretzel Kids. So I'll follow up with you guys all after this with a replay. So you'll be able to watch it at, on your own time if you miss anything or just have any follow-up questions. I'll be in touch with Corey Sterling, so we can always pass those along to him. In the meantime, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Corey Kelleher from the Pretzel Kids team will be pulling those questions out for Corey Sterling at the end of our presentation. So with that, I am going to pass it along to Corey Sterling and uh, let him take the stage. Thank you so much for that, Robin. And how, let's get the other Corey to unmute for a second as well. Hello, hi everyone. I'm Corey Kay, <laughs> not a lawyer, but. <laughs> and this is, you know, for, from all the presentations I've ever given in my life, this is the first time I've ever worked with someone whose name is also Corey. Really? Wow. Yeah. So it's like, a great the, vibe, the vibes are high. They're yeah. very, very, yeah, I'm feeling it. A good sign. <laughs> I myself, I'm a C-O-R-Y. You're a C-O-R-E-Y. I mean, it, it's a good distinction. I'll take, as long as it's not a K, I'm fine. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, exactly. Um, well, nice to meet everyone. I hope you're doing great and having an, an awesome Wednesday afternoon. Um, Pretzel Kids is awesome. I think it's a, I love the idea of, obviously I love the idea of kids yoga and coming up with great systems and programs to be able to offer that as best as possible. But I'm also just like, I'm a massive snack guy. I'm, I'm in addition to being a lawyer and having written the yoga law book, I just love eating snacks. So just when I hear Pretzel Kids, I'm like, whoa, there's a pretzel, maybe there's some butter, there's some salt. Um, and, uh, and that just gets me excited. So why don't we just start off? I see Becky's drinking something. Ve Becky's already got like, Becky's got a smoothie or something. Um, that's really exciting, but why doesn't everyone just go in the chat and, um, why don't you write down if you're either, if you're eating a snack right now, what snack you're eating, or if you're not eating a snack right now, what your favorite snack is. Let's just get straight to snack time. So um, you can write where you're from, where you're tuning in from. And let's do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm, this is always for me, this is like the most exciting part of my day, either talking about snacks or seeing, okay, what do we got? 
Um, sipping a, a Corey's on an iced matcha, very good. Ellen, the most delish smoothie bowl with granola, coconut, and pineapple. Um, you're in, you're the front leader. Robin's a cafe latte here from PK Central in Boston. Fun. A lot of Boston. Smoothie on my lunch break, raisins, apples, and cashew butter. Modesto, what's up? Um, hi from Texas, chips and salsa. I feel like that's a fitting, I feel like chips and salsa would be a fitting Texas snack. And then upstate New York, salsa and tortilla. Okay. I'd say I, I like this. No one said pretzels. Um, don't know what to make of that, but uh, but it's all good for me. This is like, I was preparing this as we started. This is my green tea. Um, it's it's Argentinian, and um, and I, I love I love drinking green tea. It's it's called yerba mate. If you ever have the privilege, doesn't it just look cool? Like you've no one knows what's going on in here, but um, but whatever it is, it's cool. So um, yogurt covered pretzels. There you go. It's fittingly. It has to be. We knew the name came from somewhere. Um, so it's firstly, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I love chatting about yoga law and, and how it relates to, you know, all sort of different yoga professionals, whether it's with kids, whether it's prenatal, whatever it is. Um, and the first thing I want to share with you guys is just a link to, um, a yoga, basically like a yoga law checklist and the way that and I'm going to post it in the chat. And maybe if, if there's a replay, um, it could, we could post it there. But the reason why I always include this checklist is because the most common thing that we'll see with yoga professionals is like, they don't know what they don't know, right? Does, has anyone, does anyone here experience that? Where it's like, oh yeah, like I've gone through my yoga teacher training. I know how to be a yoga teacher, but I really don't know anything about law as it relates to operating a small business. So the purpose of that checklist is to give you a sort of roadmap of, of what you can navigate um, in terms of moving forward and just know, sort of like being able to issue spot sort of um, what, what different things you're gonna need to be aware of. And, and also that being said, the most important point of this time together for all of us um, is that you ask questions if you have them, right? Like it's obviously, this is an intimate group, it's a smaller setting. So if at any point you have a question or you wanna unmute and you wanna tell me what you're up to and some questions you might have. I'm happy to you know, share my, my expertise and, and my years of working with hundreds of yoga professionals to, um, to sort of assist with that. And I think at the same time, I'll just, I'll post them a copy of a link to the yoga law book that I wrote. And just to share a little bit, because obviously it's, it's all super relevant. Um, the, the reason why I originally wrote this book, here's, I, I've just posted a, a link to it in the chat. Um, I wrote a book on yoga law because I was like, I was going through my own journey a little bit of understanding how and where I wanted to be a lawyer. And, you know, you go to law school, you, you, you're always learning about you know, liberty, access to justice, doing the right thing. And you, you have all these grandiose ideas of how you'll be able to be a lawyer and make the world a better place. And I got a really good jo job at a top law firm. It was the biggest law firm in the world. And it was just like completely the opposite of everything that I had hoped that it would be, right? As I'm sure you could imagine. Um, I, was, I was not happy. I was not enjoying my work. And I just realized that I was always spending more and more of my time at yoga studios with my friends. And it was sort of like, I would be in one of two places. I would be at work or I would be at, you know, at the yoga studio doing class or hanging out with my friends there or, you know, cooking, all of us cooking dinner together, whatever it is that we did. And then one time I went to a class, one of my favorite teachers was doing a class um, and she decided to do it like she was, she was leaving one studio and she didn't have, she didn't have a studio that she was working with. So she's like, oh, I'm just going to do a class in my sister's apartment building common room, right? As you do, like the next natural step for the place to do yoga. So we sort of, we all showed up there and nobody signed a waiver of liability. And I'm, the first thing I'm going to talk about is going to be waivers of liability. But we show up to this space that's not in a yoga studio. No one signed a waiver of liability. And someone got very, very, very hurt during that class. It wasn't a safe space. There were like these big columns in the middle of the room. And someone got hurt. 
and the teacher was definitely negligent. The teacher was definitely responsible. And not only was the teacher responsible, none of us signed waivers. It wasn't associated with the studio and we were practicing outside of a safe space. And so like we went through the class and we're in Shavasana and I'm just like, oh my God, I just have to go up to this teacher and tell them, you know, you know, do you realize you're at risk and all of these things and how it went wrong. And, you know, my lawyer mind is just running and running and running. And then at the end of the class, I go up to the teacher and I was like, hey, you know, thank you for such a great yoga class. You know, that, that person who left was really injured. Um, you know, we didn't sign waivers of liability. You're, you're really exposed to risk here. And, and she, she had a new fam, like she had a young child, you know, yoga teacher making, her, making it on her own, not working under the protection of an LLC or a, or a corporation. And she was just completely oblivious to all of the risks that were that that she was participating in. And it was like, I was like, you know, like none of us signed a waiver and this, you know, this isn't cool and your assets are at risk. But it was just sort of like this glazed over look. And that's what really scared me the most and confused me the most. And so that was like the first step of me realizing oh, like there are a lot of yoga teachers who probably don't understand anything about the law and, and don't understand what they should be doing and what their exposure to risk is. Um, and, then, and then I sort of like, while I was working at this big firm, I was working with all of my yoga friends on the side. And the more that I, I got into it, the more I realized that no one knew what was going on. Like yoga professionals, there wasn't any resource to teach yoga teachers about the law and explain to them you know, how they had to be at best practices in different types of relationships. And so then I, I started my own law firm called Conscious Counsel, which I'm still working with. Um, and in doing so, I just like the first year of my practice, I was helping mostly yogis and other small business owners. And I just saw everyone making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And I was like, okay, like, it does clearly no one knows what's going on. This information is not that it's not that complex. If you've never heard about it, for sure, if you don't know what you don't know. And I get that. But I wanted to make a resource to make all of this information accessible and easy and fun and share. So, you know, share it in, in a loving way. And so that's when I wrote that book. And then after I wrote the book, there was just so much response from professionals to be like, yes, you're totally right. I didn't know any of this stuff or you know, thank you for making it relatable. So um, I've got a lot of experience. I've got, I've got a lot of information to share and, and I'm excited to do that today. But also that being said, like the questions come up, you totally a safe space with me. You can share anything you want. And, you know, it's, it's not judgmental. And, and the point of, of you walking away today is having practical information for you understanding where you are at risk and, and where you can be at best practices. So um, I'll, I'll sort of just start with waivers of liability because this is, to me, it's the fundamental agreement. It's the agreement that's going to help you protect your assets the best. And it's the most important one to have. So the reason why a waiver of liability is, it's so important to have a well-drafted waiver of liability is because this is the document that really prevents you from getting sued from the most, the, the easiest way for you to get sued is that someone's doing a class with you, they somehow get injured in an unforeseen way, they hold you responsible, and then they decide to sue you. Let's say you're using a waiver of liability that is not specific to you or your business, you're, you copied it from someone. I literally just got off the phone with a client who um, I sold a waiver to and a couple of other documents. And they're like, oh, well, like I looked at, you know, I just borrowed it from another studio. Like, it's amazing how they'll be like, yeah, it always starts with like, yeah, we've got legal documents. And I'm like, okay, cool. Tell me about them. Who drafted them? Where do they come from? And then the more you get down to it, people are people, it's very common for people just to copy agreements from somewhere that they believe is a reputable source. And the one thing that I always say is like, you firstly, waivers of liability are like seatbelts in the sense that like, you don't need it until you do, but when you need it, a good, a good and properly functioning seatbelt will save your biz, like will save your life. The same way a good and properly functioning waiver of liability will save your life. But like, you know, taking a seatbelt out from someone else's car and trying to install it yourself and then use it as a seatbelt in the event that you need it, you know, there, there's a lot of risk that comes with that. So um, the, the reason why waivers are different than all of the other agreements is that, you know, uh, I'm gonna talk about trademarks today. I'm gonna talk about client service agreements. 
I'm going to talk about all of these other relationships. And, and the truth is, in almost every other relationship, other than a waiver of liability, when you get into the relationship, you have an idea of what your exposure to liability is going to be, right? So let's say I'm a, I'm a yoga teacher and I'm, uh, and just for this example, I have a, an online yoga studio that I operate and I have, I do three classes a day and uh, members get unlimited access to all of my classes and, and any pre-recorded materials. And in exchange for that, they pay $65 a month for unlimited yoga, three times a day group classes, right? Let's say I have a membership agreement or I have a service agreement. And in, in doing that, someone signs up, you know, they pay for three months. I've got a special for three months. They do it for a week. They don't really like it. They want a refund, right? Now we're, we get into consumer protection laws, but all I mean to say is like, in a worst case scenario, I know that my exposure to liability is going to be you know, whatever special price that I gave them for three months, or it's going to be $65, like it'll be $65. So like, I'm going to have an agreement, I'm going to communicate my expectations openly and honestly, I'm going to have agreements that talk about expectations and whatever, you know, what we're going to provide and what they're, they're going, what we expect from them and showing up. But in a worst case scenario that there's a client who's extremely dissatisfied and totally upset, the maximum exposure to liability is going to be the amount that they've paid me, right? Does, does that concept make sense? When it comes to waivers of liability, you, at, at law, when you are facilitating an activity for someone, you have something that's called a duty of care. And basically what the duty of care means is that you have a responsibility to make sure that whoever is participating in an activity with you does not get injured by virtue of doing that activity, right? That they don't suffer damages. So let's say that they do suffer damages and you're doing the activity, then you're going to be responsible because you at law had a responsibility to make sure that they were not going to get hurt. In fact, they did get hurt. And then as such, you're responsible to pay the damages of whatever they suffered. Does that concept make sense? Cool. Thumbs up if, if this, if it resonates. Fantastic. So you have a duty of care subject. Let's say nothing is signed between the, between you and your students. You have a duty of care to make sure they're safe. The reason why waivers of liability are different is because you do not know going into that, what possible damages you will be liable for. Right. So especially, and like, let's say if, let's say you're working with kids, which it's not, it doesn't make it more dangerous, but it's, let's say, if, God forbid, I'm knocking on a real piece of wood. My dogs are running because they thought they think that someone's at the door. Um, but like, God forbid, one of the children gets injured in a yoga class and then suffer, you know, now has a condition or a significant decrease in enjoyment of life for the rest of their life. The way that courts operate is they, they run something called a quantum of damages where they're like, okay, you know, this is the injury that suffered. This is how long it's going to last. And then they put an approximate value, monetary value on what it would cost for you to compensate that particular person in order to make sure that they are whole again. The whole idea of someone suing someone else is like, you contributed to this person suffering damages or being at a loss. And as such, it's your legal responsibility to make sure that they are whole again and pay them back until they are whole. So, the, again, so this is all about like why the waiver is so important, because when you're dealing with a waiver of liability, it's not going to be $65 that you have to pay to make sure that someone's whole again. If it gets to the fact where you facilitate an activity, the waiver of liability was not good enough, you are held responsible, the, the amount of damages can be very, very, very significant. And that's why if there's one document that you really want to hit out of the park and totally get correct, it's the waiver of liability. So that's like all of this is just the framing and the setting up. I'm going to now talk about what the different elements of a waiver of liability are and go into the specifics and the rationale behind it. But if the question is, why do waivers of liability matter? The answer is because it's, a, it's an undetermined, your liability is undetermined and it can be very, very significant, right? Cool, are, are we all on the same page? Fantastic, thumbs up. So um, that being said, 
the, the whole idea is that remember, like, let's say no one has signed a legal agreement and someone's doing yoga with you. You have a duty of care. If they get injured, you're going to be responsible. The courts have said, okay, cool. Well, we're going to, we're going to let people sign a document in which they relinquish or release or waive liability to the service provider. So government and courts and laws have said, okay, we will accept this. We, we accept that someone can sign a paper we, that will essentially, essentially mean that they revoke their right to sue you. They revoke their legal rights that they have. But in order to do so, the document has to be very, very clearly drafted. And it has to be drafted towards the specific activities and risks that the participant is participating in, right? So this is, this is where why working with a professional on waivers of liability is so important and so helpful. Um, because what you want to make sure happens is that the waiver of liability covers the activities that you do and the ways that you do it. And what's the rationale? Government, the governments, courts, the laws, they're reluctant to let people sign away their rights, although they will let them do it. But the condition is that it has to be clear enough. So the only way that they're actually going to let that they're going to uphold a waiver of liability is if before signing it, someone clearly understood everything they were getting themselves into. They understood the risks. They under, understood the outcomes. They were healthy enough to par participate. They voluntarily participated and they agreed to release liability. So that's, I'm just going to break down each of those individually so you have an idea or, or understand what it's about. But remember, this is all about someone signing away their legal rights. And in order to do so, it has to be extremely clear what you're doing. So the first thing that you have to include in a waiver of liability, and like, especially now that COVID is a thing, is you have to let people know what activity you're doing. And I think someone just unmuted, but I'm going to keep going anyways. Um, you have to let someone know what activities they're doing. So in, in my opinion, and I've worked, I've had stories where I've, I've been hired by people to challenge a waiver of liability, and I've been hired by people to, um, to defend a waiver of liability. It's always going to come down to how specific the waiver of liability is drafted. So as an example, um, you're going to want to include the different modalities of yoga that you practice. And you're going to want to try to be as specific about that as possible. And remember that so long as the activities you do stay the same, you don't need someone to re-sign it every time they work with you. So the idea is like, do it properly the first time, include all of the things that you're going to do or that you may do. And then as such, you, you don't need to go back and have people re-sign, but you also know that you're comfortably covered because you've listed all of the things. So as an example, right, let's say I, I teach prenatal yoga, pre and postnatal yoga. Does anyone here hands up if you teach prenatal or postnatal yoga? Okay, no, no one in the group does, which is cool, but it, it, it's, it's a good illustrative example. The risk, the activities that you're doing in prenatal and postnatal yoga are different than a normal Ashtanga class or a normal yin class or, you know, or, or any, any sort of basic normal yoga practice, because the activities are different. You're doing this yoga while you're pregnant. And as such, the risks of doing this activity are different, that there may be complications by whatever happens and this, that, or the other, right? So let's say you're doing pre, pre or postnatal yoga, and you don't include anything about those specifics, and you just get someone to sign, hey, we're going to be doing yoga together, and right, because if you're just doing yoga, the risks wouldn't be, you know, complications of pregnancy. It would be, uh, you know, sore muscles, broken bones, whatever, you know, all of the, the different things that you're doing. So you want to, the first thing you want to do when you're customizing your waiver of liability, it's to be as specific as possible that you can be about it. And like, you don't have to go overboard, but you just have to reverse engineer the situation where it's like, if someone got injured doing this with me, would my document have clearly told them that they could have expected to A, do that activity and B, that that, you know, suffer that potential harm as a result of doing the activity. And, and that's the crux of it. So where we've seen this change for yoga professionals has been a lot around um, now that we're doing things online, 
Now that we've got video libraries of content, right? Evergreen content, uh, Zoom classes. If we're doing things in people's personal homes, it's changed. If we're doing things in public spaces, it's changed. And in, in addition to that, the specifics around the, the types of yoga that you're doing and what equipment that you're using. So, and, and also in addition to that, the fact that there's, you know, a communicable disease that's going around and it's possible that someone could potentially catch that communicable disease by virtue of participating in that in-person activity. So it's like, it, it, I don't want it, it, it shouldn't be intimidating. And really what the practice for everyone to do who's listening, if, if you, you know, if, if you're confident or if you want to draft your own waiver, or even if you're, you know, going to work with another lawyer and doing it, it's you want to write down the activities that you do, the ways that you do it, the places you do it, and you want to make sure that you mention COVID as well. And then, so first I'll just pause there. Does anyone have any questions about any of this so far? Hi, no. I have a question. There we go. Hi, Mikey. this is Mikey. What's up, Mikey? <laughs> so um, I've been teaching yoga classes at a preschool, and I do not have a liability waiver. The classes have been going on now for, um, I think this is our third week. Is it too late now to go back and ask for a waiver, or should I wait for the series to end and introduce the waiver with the next group? You are going to want, Mikey, lovely question. And it's it actually like yoga at preschool sounds a lot of fun. <laughs> I just see it. Do preschool kids wear diapers or are they past that? They're past that. They go to the bathroom a lot though. <laughs> yeah, you can always just show up with a diaper anyways if you feel like it. Um, you want to you wanna get the waiver of liability signed ASAP. So okay. you're going to want to get a, a waiver of liability to protect you for what you're doing. And I, I'm going to specifically talk about kids waivers in, in just one second. Okay. Um, but you, the only thing that you, it's, it's always a way of how you, um, how you phrase this. And it's all like, you can just let people know like, Hey, I'm so excited to be continuing to offer these different services, you know, to offer a yoga class. You know, I, uh, I've, and you, you don't need to explain why, but, you know, part of me being comfortable practicing with you is having all of the, the guardians or parents sign a waiver of liability before we can let their kids participate in classes. And so here is a copy. If you can bring a signed copy to the next class, that would be wonderful. Right. It's, it's a lot of it. It's often about framing. Okay. Does that, sound, does that make sense? Yeah, no, thank you. Pleasure. I see oh, Fel Felicia has her hand up. Hi, um, can you guys hear me okay? I'm in transit. Yeah. Okay, um, I had actually the very same question, just wondering if we needed to like wait for a new series to start if we're already in a series or program. Um, so thank you for answering that question. And then my second question is if we are like take, teaching classes you know, through another organization like a school or summer camp or preschool. Um, and so two parts, if the center has our, or the organization has had the family sign a waiver, um, do we need an additional waiver um, or is the one that they signed suffice? And then the second part to that is, do we need a waiver between us and the organization in addition to um, us, you know, what we're teaching with the individual students and families. So th those are awesome. Those are wonderful questions. The, you, you should ask, you should ask whoever is the, you know, the branch organization or the head organization, you should ask them to see a copy of the waiver of liability that they use. Okay. Because it is, it is possible that you are covered under the waiver of liability. It's very common in a waiver to see language where it says something like, you know, um, you hereby release, you know, kindergarten school X plus any contractors, employees, or teachers who, who are offering services related to this. So A, you want to double, you want to review the waiver and double check that it, that it's fine. And also, okay. like, I don't, and I don't want to be, I'm not a party pooper. I'm not a party pooper. I'm a best <laughs> practices enforcer. So the other thing that you'd want to do is you'd want to get some form of professional opinion around that waiver of liability. 
because it's entirely possible that they've just cut corners and decided not to get a customized waiver. And then if you're relying on the strength of their agreement, you are part and parcel in, in, in the same, have the same risk that they have, right? It's, hey, right. does that make sense? Yes, it does. I just, and then, uh, and then sorry. in terms, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna hop in, Corey, and let yeah, go for it, Robin Lisa and Mikey know real quick. We can talk offline, but at Pretzel Kids, we have an in-house trademark attorney, and we have waivers available to all of our Pretzel Kids instructors that are using our brand to teach. So, um, okay. circle back with me about that because they are okay. all those waivers are downloadable for you guys in our group. So that should make it easier for, for you. Um, I'll let Corey take it from here, but I just wanted Mikey okay. and Felicia to know that because that is available to you guys. Great, thank you. Fantastic, so then that, that being said, the, the answer to your question is if, if you have these agreements that you should be using, at best practices, you would want to, um, you would want to have, ideally you could try to find a way to get everyone to sign the waiver. Because when you're using the organization's waiver, you are, you're relying on the strength of how well that document is drafted for them. Um, and that's like, yeah, I've, I've seen that situation. I've been part of stories where that situation doesn't go well. And then the second question is, I think you were asking like, should we have an agreement? Do we get them to sign a waiver with us? And the answer is that they sh you should have signed a contractor agreement with them. Uh, right. I would assume some, either an employment agreement or a contract agreement. And then you would want that agreement to have something called an indemnity provision. And I'll write okay. the word in bold in chat. Um, uh, I'm going to write to everyone, indemnity. And what that basically says is that they accept responsibility for anything that happens to you while you provide those services. And okay. so, and so like, yeah, it's, there's a little bit of work involved for all of this, but you know, like from, from the examples I've been through with clients who have gotten sued, I would say it's worth taking the time to make sure that you read best practices. And like, if someone's hiring you, they accept the responsibility, you're covered under their insurance in addition to your insurance, all those sorts of things. Great, sounds good, thank you. Well, no worries, pleasure. Um, anyone else or should I keep rolling? Okay, um, so the, 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 basically, yeah, so as clearly as possible, you wanna list the different activities that you're doing and, um, and how you do them and, and you know, all of the specifics around it. And then based on the activities that you include, that's, that's how you would know and, and that's the, the waiver would cover what the risks are. So the activities are like, hey, this is what we're doing. The risks is like, you know, as a result of us doing this, these are the different risks that could materialize. And then after that, you have to write what the outcome of the risks could be. So the outcome of the risk could be, you know, permanent body damage, change of quality of living, migraines, like there's, and, and you don't, you don't need to write a novel about it, but you need to be able to have things so that in the event that someone gets injured, um, you would, you would clearly be able to, um, you'd be able to say like, hey, we told you that this could happen, right? That's like in plain English, what all of a waiver is about is like, we told you what we were gonna do. We told you what could possibly happen. You know, we told you the outcomes from the dangers of, of this activity. And then, you know, someone understanding all of the activities, all of the risks, all of the outcomes, someone can then, you know, uh, voluntarily agree to participate. So they'll say, hey, you know, understood, uh, I'm choosing or I'm choosing to let my child participate on their own accord of this. Um, and then someone, they, you know, they affirm that they're healthy enough, they don't have any knowledge of, um, of any, you know, medical information of why they would be at extra risk or why they wouldn't be able to participate. And then lastly, they release you of liability. So sort of just as a summary to wrap up waivers of liability, it's about the activities being a specific about how, how you do, what you do, where you do it, what you do it with in terms of equipment, then it's what the risks are, what the outcomes of the risks are. Once someone understands the activities, the risks, the outcomes, then they can choose to voluntarily participate. 
Um, and then they affirm that they're healthy enough and then they agree to release you of liability. So those are waivers of liability sort of in a nutshell. And if, and if that's all, if that's all cool, I'll chat a little bit about service agreements and then I'll chat about, um, okay, cool. Corey, why don't you hop on and, and read the question from Sky? Yes, uh, Sky. Um, so she has a question about extra risk. If a student identifies that they have a pre existing condition of any kind, of, of some kind, how, oh, sorry, how do you, oh, typo, how do you move forward with them? <laughs> okay, so if a student has, a pre-existing condition of any kind, how do you move forward with that? How do you deal with that? So the, the thing to know about, uh, about disclosure of pre-existing conditions is that what it does is it increases the standard of care that you have, right? So a duty of care just means that there's an established relationship at law that you have to, you know, you're facilitating an activity and there's tons of case law that says, you know, a yoga teacher and a yoga student, the yoga teacher is responsible to make sure the student will be okay. Then when it comes to a standard of care, it's like, well, how, you know, how well, how, how high is your expertise? And as a result of that, how much, you know, uh, how, how well should you have behaved? You know, and, and it's always the, the standard of care is all about that. Okay, you have the duty, but maybe you, you know, you, you, the duty of care exists. But in a standard of care, because you specialize and you've done an extra training in kids yoga, and and let's say a kid got injured, um, you you were that you were extra trained, so you have an, a higher standard of care to make sure that that a child is going to be safe and working with you. And how that relates to pre-existing conditions is like when the more information you have about uh, an injured student or a, a, a student with injuries all that it does is increases the standard of care that you have, right? And the more that you have to pay attention to them in that particular injury. So like, let's say hypothetically, let's say you're at a studio, right? Well, you're not at a studio, so I won't even give that example. But all I mean to say, Sky, is let's say um, one, one, of your, one, of your, one of your clients or one of your students uh, has lower back problems. And they, you know, they read through the waiver of liability and they just say to you, hey, Sky, just so you know, um, you know, I've had a couple of surgeries on my lower back and this has been a problem for me for a long time, um, but I still want to practice yoga with you. And then, okay, cool. Sky's off and she's doing classes and we're really relaxed and it's really chilled about anything related to lower back. But then like four months down the road, one time you forget and then, you know, you get them in uh, like shoulder stand and they really, they re-injure their back. They can no longer go to work, all of those things. You, you're going to be more, it's easier to show that you were more negligent because you had a higher standard of care because you knew about that injury and then you still put them doing that particular work that they were doing. So it's an example of something that's sort of like a straight, because it, it always comes down to your behavior, right? That when, when, if you're getting sued, someone's going to say, hey, you had a responsibility to make sure that I was going to be safe and working with you. And as a result, um, you know, I, I told you I had a back injury. You put me through a very dangerous back exercise. And as a result, I got injured again. In that case, you're just more exposed to liability. And it's easier for someone to be able to come up with a case against you because the standard of care is higher. That's why at Conscious Council, when we draft agreements, we always put the onus on the student to, we draft the agreement to protect teachers as much as possible to say, hey, you understand that you can participate in these agree you know, participate in these activities and we've been super clear in explaining them to you. Um, and, and then what that does, hold on, the wind keeps blowing my doors. Give me one sec, guys. Um, so, so I, I hope, I hope that makes sense that the answer to your question is that when someone shares that information, it raises your standard of care. And in the event that you make a mistake, it would just show that you were more negligent, which is why the way that we design our documents is to put the onus on the student to report that I I've seen other waivers where people in the waiver will ask for any injuries, but I avoid doing that because I find that puts my client legally at more risk. 
And Sky says very, V helpful, thank you. Um, anyone else, we good to keep going? I'm gonna introduce, I've got two dogs. This, is, this guy's name is Gringo. Gringo, say what's up. Do you love waivers of liability? He's like, he's into them. He loves them. He's like, he's napping. He was lying on the couch. But when he, anytime he passes by, I feel like it's worthwhile. Um, adorable, that's it. I really just, I bring the dogs on because I'm looking for compliments. That's really the express purpose um, of doing that. I have, I have another dog that I'm going to, I'll, her name is Lua. I'll bring her out in a second. So um, let's quickly talk about service agreements, right? So at Conscious Council, the whole way that we work with our yoga clients and explain a lot of them is you want to break down the different relationships that you have. And in each relationship, you want to have a document, a signed document that helps to communicate your expectations openly and honestly. And what I can tell you from working with hundreds of yoga professionals um, over the years is that the clients who have great documents that they use upfront do not run into problems further down the line. Not as a universal law, but most of the problems that I have to fix as a lawyer are something around misaligned expectations or miscommunication or something that wasn't communicated in the relationship and also something that wasn't signed. And like, here's just the example of, of, of how it works. Let's say I'm a, I'm a yoga teacher, I'm working with kids and I'm doing one-on-one -on -one privates, right? Okay, so I get, I have a, an agreement that I get the parents to sign. I explain all of the specifics around it. This is how payment works. This is how cancellation works. This is what happens if your child throws a temper tantrum, right? Could we put in a temper tantrum provision? I don't know, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, but you just, you want to communicate all of the expectations up front. Now, in the event that, you know, the child is very difficult to work with, or they, they always show up late, or they always complain, or they always cry, or, or whatever it is, when you don't have a written agreement, it's very difficult to have a constructive conversation about that. People will often take it personally, they'll think it's about them, they think it's about their kid, whatever it is. Conversely, when you have a document that communicates your expectations openly and honestly, and someone has to agree to it before you start working together, the moment they step out of line or the moment their kid steps out of line in that particular relationship, all you have to do is send them a screenshot of the document and just be like, hey, before we started working together, this is, you know, this is what we said about cancellations, or this is what we said about refunds, or this is what we said about temper tantrums. And, you know, lately the following, you know, X has been happening. How can we restore integrity around the situation? Or how can we move forward so that both of us can keep our word to what we signed? And it's like, it's just such a powerful difference for you as a, as a, as a professional to be able to have that particular support. And like, in some ways, is it, is it, you know, do you really need an agreement with your clients? There's a lot of people who could say, no, you know, I, I don't need a, an agreement with my clients. It's always been a handshake deal or whatever it is. But the reality is this is about, for you, it's about creating a dream relationship that you have with your clients. It's about before you invest your time and energy in working with someone that you're super clear. And also it's about you being protected and the money that you work so hard to bring in being protected. And, and that's really like a service agreement is really fundamental in, um, in having great relationships and looking at it as an accountability and a communicative tool instead of a contract that, you know, blah, 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 or whatever stories you have about agreements that you don't want to use. Like everything that I'm, I've been sharing with you are things to protect you and put you in a position to succeed and feel comfortable in your business. And, and, and that's the whole point of it, but I'm happy to um, answer. Does anyone have any questions about service agreements or any comments, anything specifically I can help with? We're good. Yeah, Mikey, let's go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is so helpful. I think for me, I was just so excited to be, you know, doing my classes. I just jumped in and it wasn't until probably about a week ago when one of the kids, we were playing a little game and someone fell and he's crying 
telling the teacher he needs ice. And then I kind of started having a panic attack thinking, oh shoot, maybe there was something else I was supposed to have done before I started this class. Luckily he was fine, but it just you know made me think at that moment. And then I forgot totally about that and went right back to doing what I was doing, teaching classes. But no, I was gonna say, this is extremely helpful because I think you know, you just expect that everything is going to go well, but it's not until something happens when you're like, oh my gosh, I should have been more prepared. So I was just going to comment and say this has been extremely beneficial for me just as I'm getting started. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, go, Mikey, thank you. That's, I'm, I'm happy that this is helpful. Yeah. Robin, go for it. So I've been doing this for a long time and Run, run a company where we have many teachers um, and provide them with a lot of resources. But I find that, you know, I often learn by making mistakes. And as soon as I make a mistake, it goes right into, you know, a legal document or something that I can, I can share. And I find that a refund policy is really, really key. And also in this day and age, a lot of us are teaching outdoor classes, pop-up classes outdoor, whether it be for kids or for adults. And something that you might not even think about um, that came up with us recently is I had all, we were doing a pop-up class. Actually, one of my other teachers was teaching it. We had a bunch of kids. They all signed the waiver. The refund policy was airtight. And one thing I forgot to add in there was our rain date policy. And you think like that's a simple thing, like no one's going to get hurt if it rains and they miss a class, but you could have a lot of students or parents or whomever your clients are like screaming at you because like, do we get a makeup? Do we get a refund? Like what happens? So just saying like, think of all those things ahead of time. And like Corey said, build them into your terms of service. So in this case, I went back and I sent them something like, okay, we'll have a rain day, but you know, kind of did a little addendum thing because I do have a rain day policy, but for whatever reason, didn't put it into this particular COVID pop-up class. Cause each one I, I, I copy and paste, but sometimes forget or don't customize it in the way I should even now. So, you know, you live and you learn and I will never forget about a rain day policy again ever because you know if it's one rain date that tax on is it two is it a refund so just little things like that just you know do it up front and you'll save yourself a lot of time because i could have just sent this and said yes you get one rain date instead it was you know having to like talk to multiple parents and figure it out cool thank you for sharing that robin Soup, yeah, re obviously refunds are really important. The rules around refunds have changed a bit just with everyone moving to like auto pay memberships. I don't know if that applies to this particular group, but like there, there are new consumer protection laws that have, that have been introduced around it. So the one thing that I'll just say around no refund policies is like, it doesn't work, it doesn't work where, you know, um, someone signs up for an annual program and then the next day if they wanna cancel and you're like, no, we said no refunds. The, the consumer protection laws are changing and have changed. So it's like a no run, a no refund policy is not always airtight in that sense, but it can be drafted to best practices. And in, in the same, in the same line of what Robin's sharing, one of my first clients um, did not have a no refund provision. And I, I think in my book, I wrote a whole chapter about no refunds because one of my first clients did not have a no refund provision and did a massive project for clients. And at the end, the client was like, no, I don't like this. I'm not satisfied and, and sued her for the full purchase price, which was like 30 something thousand dollars. Whereas if we would have had a no refund policy included, then it's, it's, um, it's open and shut. It, it's a non-issue. So that's like in the same way. And I didn't draft that client. I was just helping my client work through it in the same way how Robin will not forget to have a rainy day policy for her agreements, I learned very early the importance of having um, a no refund policy included. So um, we've, got 10, we've got 10 minutes left. I, I wanna chat about trademarks. I promised I was going to. Um, and so uh, the, the important thing just to know is that 
Look, the, the, the trickiest thing about the, the trickiest thing as it relates to trademarks is that this is the one issue where people don't realize that they're at risk. And it's something where like you could sort of get lulled into complacency where, you know, you start a business name, it's going really well, or you've got a cool logo or whatever it is, and you're going for years and years and years and you never register a trademark and you feel like you never need to or you never would need to. And then like one day you get a cease and desist letter saying, hey, this business has registered the trademark of this particular name or with this particular logo. And now you have to change your website, you have to change your marketing, you have to change your branding, you have to change all of these things. And like, I, this happens to me all the time. It happened to me on Monday of this week. I got an email from a client who has a business. I actually helped them incorporate their business a year and a half ago. I did all of the documents. I told them to register a trademark. They decided that they didn't want to. And I just got an email and a screenshot from him with a copy of an existing trademark for the exact, the exact same name. And now what, what I want to explain for, for all of this is just that um, the government wants you to register a trademark. So the rules of the game are designed to favor those who register a trademark as opposed to those who do not. And the reason, the way that it works is, let's say that, let's take, let's take Pretzel Kids, just the name, Pretzel Kids, right? So let's say Pretzel Kids, our Pretzel Kids run by Robin, has been around for how many years, Robin? 15. <laughs> 15 years, okay. So, and we're just gonna assume for this, for the illustration that you've never registered a trademark, although I, I do see a registered TM around your logo. So I assume that that's been taken care of. Um, so Pretzel Kids is going, we're going for 15 years. There's another Pretzel Kids that opens in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, and they've been open for a year. Now, before anyone registers, it always comes down to who's been using it for longer. So 15 years versus one year, there's no question 15 years has it longer, right? So Robin and Pretzel Kids from Massachusetts is safe. Now, the next time that it goes, now, now, so that's unregistered, but government encourages people to register and benefits those who register. So let's say Pretzel Kids in New Mexico decides to go ahead and register Pretzel Kids. I'm, hap I'm very happy that you have your certificate. I believe you, Robin. Congratulations, round of applause. Um, but let, let's say this other, um, the other Pretzel Kids in, in New Mexico that's been around for one year decides, hey, I wanna register my trademark name. They submit the application. The moment the application is submitted, they jump above the Pretzel Kids in Massachusetts that's been around for 15 years. So even just submitting the application, even before you're approved, at law, you have better rights. And then the more, the longer that, you know, this other newer Pretzel Kids is in operation and the closer they get to actually receiving a certificate, the more difficult it will be for Robin to challenge that application. And once, once a certificate is given and the USPTO approves the trademark, at that point, it's very, very, very difficult. It's like, it's like 95% chance that you would not be able to dispute it and that you will, you'd have to pay a lot of money to legally challenge it. So the reason why I share that is like, it's, it should be, the registration of a trademark should be viewed as like the cost of doing business and something that is just part and parcel with becoming a professional and building a brand. And the risk that you run is like, what just happened to my client this Monday, last month I had a client who's been in business for 20 years, another business who's only been around for two, came in, registered a trademark, now we're trying to oppose that registration, costs a lot of money, it's very stressful, it's a lot of time. And so the important things to know for trademark is like, it's not, it, it's, it, the best right is who's been using it longer until someone decides to register. So because we don't control what we, we can only control what we control. We want to make sure that we register when, you know, as soon as possible from when we know that we're going to use a brand and how it's going to work and that we're really married to it. And, and that's what we're sticking with. Um, and then just quickly, the, the, the three benefits of registration for a trademark is, one is exclusive use. It means that you are the only one who's allowed to use it. Um, 
Two is that you have enforceable rights, which means that if someone else registers, you can send them a cease and desist. You're allowed to assert the rights that you have under that trademark. You can also, and I'm sure Robin has this in place, you can also you know, create licensing agreements. When your brand has a certain amount of goodwill, other people will pay you to use their brand. So Pretzel Kids is a recognizable brand and there is you know, inherent market value in someone working with a Pretzel Kids certified instructor. And so in exchange for you using the registered trademarks or the registered copyright of Pretzel Kids, um, you, know, you can sign a licensing agreement which dictates how people use the intellectual property, how it can be revoked, what the jurisdictional limits are, um, the amount that needs to be paid for it, all of those things. And then lastly, the, the final benefit about having a trademark is you avoid that situation where a year, two years, three years down the line, you get a cease and desist letter from someone else who registered the trademark while you were asleep at the wheel and says, hey, change your website, change your logo, change your branding, change everything. You know, your mark would be misleading with our mark. And as such, you know, you have to stop using it right now. So um, I'm gonna post, I'm gonna post in the chat my email address. And I see Ellen has a question. So I'm gonna answer that in one second. But, um, and, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, you can share this on the replay or whatever we send out. But if any of this, you know, if you have any questions that, you know, you'd like answer, you'd like to work together, feel free to, to send me an email following this. Um, so now Ellen's question is, question re-trademark, what if a company has your name outside of the U.S.? What's the reach on trademark U.S. only? So there are different jurisdictions with trademarks, and there are something called treaties between different countries as it relates to trademarks. Um, if you already see a company outside of the United States that's been using their trademark for years and they've not registered in the United States, I would register in the United States ASAP um, because the way that it normally works is based on these treaties between different jurisdictions, you know, United Kingdom, Australia, Europe, Canada, USA, um, once someone registers in one jurisdiction, you have like a safe zone time period to register in another country that's part of the same treaty. But once that time elapses, it's as if you did you never registered at all. So if 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 there's a registration, you know, in the United Kingdom or in Europe or in Canada for the same name that you have for your business, and let's say it's like two months old or three months old, then I would wait you know, I would look up or I'd work with a lawyer to understand what your rights are and what the best game plan would be. But if it's something that has existed for a while, by virtue of them not registering in the United States, they've obviously shown the intention not to register in the States. And as such, um, that's a green light for you to go and to, you know, the United States, the test is always like interstate commerce. You have to show, you can register on a state level or on, an, on a federal level, but if you're registering on a federal level, it has to be interstate commerce. So um, I think we're up for time. I hope that answered your question, um, Ellen. And otherwise, how did we do guys? Is like, is law fun? Was this, did, are we excited to look at our business and come up with amazing agreements and make sure we're protected? Cool. Yes, fun. Fun, we did it, cool. Um, so, you know, reach out to me if you need anything, Robin and Corey, thank you for having me really cool to be associated with pretzel kids and, um, yeah, and, and I hope the information's helpful and good luck being a yoga professional. We're bringing light into the community. We're doing wonderful things, especially working with kids. Like that's the next generation of people who need yoga. So let's do more and more of it and let's protect our businesses so that we can thrive and that we don't have to get side railed by dealing with lawsuits or getting sued and we have the peace of mind to grow with love and thank you i just want to thank corey so much for um giving us all of your information and sharing um your insight with us and knowledge i think it's really really valuable um so hopefully you all enjoyed this um corey k from pretzel kids and i will be sending a follow-up email to all of you that will include all of Corey Sterling's resources shared in the chat. So if you didn't get a chance to write that down or copy that, including his yoga law book and where to get that if you're interested. 
Um, we'll also include Corey Sterling's contact information if you want to reach out to him after this. Um, and if you're a Pretzel Kids teacher, you know, you guys know where to find me on Circle or via email if anyone else is interested in learning more about Pretzel Kids and what we do and what we offer. But thank you all so much for being here and participating. And uh, we hope to see you soon at another event. So have a great day, everyone. Cool. You. See you in Boston, Robin. Absolutely. Ciao. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.